With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. So you might have heard tell how Robert Williams, a man from Michigan, has brought bipartisanship to Congress. Oh, you didn't hear about that. Well, you should have last week during a congressional hearing. His story, a awful story, of how facial recognition technology was used by police to wrongfully detain him for over 30 hours. The unfortunate star of that hearing, and it was so bad that it became one of the most bipartisan hearings I've ever heard, where everybody agrees that something really bad and wrong happened here. But like a lot of congressional hearings, that's kind of where the bipartisanship stopped because everybody disagrees about what to do with it next. This is just the latest in a long line of discussion on how do we deal with the big tech, technology innovation, and how it's going to impact our society. So as we're talking about culture and politics, these lines of technology and government regulation are going to keep crisscrossing over and over and over again. So today we're going to turn to James Chernowski. James is a policy analyst. He does tech and innovation for Libertas, Utah. He's a senior contributor to Young Voices, and we had an amazingly good conversation about some really important issues like big tech regulations, the staggering amount of legislative proposals involving Section 230. And he's going to break down Robert Williams' story and how things like facial recognition are outstripping our ability to regulate, understand, and control these things. And it really becomes an issue when it becomes something like a law enforcement tool that has the full power and force of the government behind it. We're also going to talk some bigger questions like what is the internet and how here in America we're kind of a little bit spoiled on our freedom of speech and our freedom of information we get through it. We may be taking it for granted and how we need to protect it in light of what's going on in other parts of the world. So today on Herd Tell, big tech, big ideas, big freedom, how it all goes together with James Chernowski of Young Voices right after this. And I'm very happy to get a chance to talk to James Chernowski. He's a cybersecurity and technology writer, and he talks about privacy and all these things. Coming to us from the state of Utah, but you're not in Utah right now, are you, James? No, I'm actually in the great state of Florida where everything's free. (laughs) (laughs) Tough life having to go down to the Tampa Bay area. I I know it well from having family down here. Thank you so much for the time today. You've you've had quite a few irons in the fire that have crossed the culture and politics wire uh, where it comes to technology stuff. Uh, and we wanted to have you on to talk about it. You just did a piece uh, for Real Clear Policy, and the opening line was kind of the, my stat of the day that caught my eye. Uh, and I'll just read it to you. But just in 2021 alone, 17 bills introduced to Congress aimed at Section 230, five in just the last week. That's a staggering amount of legislation aimed at one specific thing. Why is 230 and the Internet and Congress and legislation, why is this all coming to a head right now, in your opinion? And why is it that we think we need to we're going to have a free speech and a freedom of the Internet issue with these issues? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Thanks for having me on. So to clarify, there were 17 bills in Congress that were introduced that were targeting Section 230. And on top of that, uh, there are five bills that are targeting antitrust that that are that are going for uh, big tech that were just released in the past week or so. And now even in the past couple of days, uh, a couple new bills have been introduced targeting Section 232. Wow, so good. very hot topic. Um, there's definitely a bipartisan uh, tech lash against the technology companies that are you know, definitely very involved in different aspects of our lives. And I think that it's just, you know, for one reason or another, we're seeing different frustrations bubble up within the political parties. For uh, those typically on the left, you you find an issue with uh, seeing these platforms as, you know, uh, centers of disinformation and misinformation, uh, and the platform's not doing enough to regulate the content that is on their platforms. Uh, And for those that are on the right and the conservatives, they feel like they are being picked on and that there is conservative viewpoint discrimination happening on these platforms and that the platforms are regulating too much already on their platforms. So there is this kind of polar opposite approach to looking at how uh, technology companies are operating and both parties have views of how to address that. And Section 230, which provides in the simplest of terms uh, an immunity for technology companies uh, from third party content that's hosted on their websites, 
uh, that law has been viewed as something that has, you know, been either abused or just used as a as a shield to, to avoid any kind of scrutiny uh, for these technology companies. And I think that the frustration is a little inappropriately placed. But right now, that's where Congress has its attention focused. My kind of overriding theory when it comes to the Internet stuff is the Internet is the greatest invention of free speech and transfer of free information mankind has ever invented. And it's as free now as it's ever going to get. And it's only going to get less free the more we tinker with it. That's not just me being kind of a wary of government regulation thing. I think that's just historically how big movements of freedom go. Uh, is that how you see it, that we should have some real, real slow moves on regulating the Internet? Because once we tighten it down, I don't think you're ever going to get it open back up. Is that how it feels to you? I, I 100% agree with that sentiment. I, I think that the problem with the Internet uh, is that it's a borderless uh, enigma, right? There, there, There is no way of really clamping down and putting a border on, on, on the Internet because it's just this – this ambiguous, you know, being. Um, I, I agree with your statement that I think that the internet has been a huge conduit for uh, making people be connected, uh, empowering their voices in the digital space more than ever possible before. And we wouldn't have seen the massive social movements like Me Too or Black Lives Matter or any of these other things without the engine of the internet and these platforms making it a reality of connecting all these people around the world to the issues that we're seeing that otherwise would not have been uh, as easily communicated to people. So I think that the internet is extremely important. And I think that when we're looking to regulate the internet, we must exercise extreme caution and think about what are the effects of the regulation that we are trying to put and what are my solutions and does this actually fix the problem I am trying to solve here is a fair question that you need to be asking all the time. And what are the unintended consequences for many of these legislation uh, you know, proposals that are out there? I don't really think uh, that there's a good enough examination of the potential consequence uh, should they be enacted as to what that would look like on a digital community. And that's dangerous because that could go and infringe on our free speech rights on the on the digital Internet. That can go and, and really, really hamper our ability to communicate with one another. And it could really just restore us back to an age that was before the Internet where you had a lot of, um, you know, guardians, uh, so to say, like with your traditional media that really controlled the flow of information, uh, whereas the Internet was able to allow for decentralization of how we got information. And I think that that was a net benefit. And I'd hate to see that get undermined because uh, everybody's so focused with their anger at big tech. It's funny you mentioned unintended consequences because the Section 230, when it was written, which was, it, you know, in the very early days of the Internet, what it became, that shield uh, between uh, liability between the platforms and the public and the government, that's not actually why it was written that way, but that's what it became. And now we have a lot of people, you know, hollering on both sides that we need to get rid of it. So I think it's really funny that we're talking about unintended consequences when something that despite the current thing, I think has been a good thing in retrospect. Uh, that kind of started as an unintended consequences, and it should be a lesson of, hey, we don't know how technology is going to advance because they didn't know there was going to be social media when they wrote that. They didn't know that there was going to be the technology we have. We didn't have smartphones then. There wasn't an iPhone yet. Uh, I think unintended consequences is something that really needs to be understood as the great unknown unknown when it comes to this tech stuff, especially when you go to regulate it, doesn't it, James? Oh, a hundred percent. I think that we need to express a, 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 a moderate sense of humility, if not more than that, uh, because we don't understand the full consequence of our actions when we go to regulate the Internet. Section 230 was pretty important when you're looking at things like Stratton Oakman, uh, which is the Wolf of Wall Street story. Uh, he sued and was able to hold an online forum accountable. Uh, you know, through that. And that was kind of bad because it was someone that was calling him out for his illegal activities. Uh, and, you know, that's 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 I think why it's important. I think people sometimes miss that Section 230 is both a sword and a shield in the sense that it was uh, set up in such a fashion to incentivize platforms to want to moderate on their own. So that way they could curate the websites and take down things that the government knew, uh, you know, that that we did not want to see, whether that's like sex trafficking or terrorism or extreme, you know, violent acts, things of that nature, um, or some other things, right? Uh, they wanted to give them that discretion and that incentive to do that uh, because before that it was just either everything could go up and you didn't moderate at all 
or nothing was allowed up because you were you were fearful of the liability. So I think that the unintended consequences is important. I think the latest change to Section 230, which was in the form of FOSTA and SESTA, um, which was aimed at looking at sex trafficking, is actually a great example of the unintended consequences. Okay, fine. You want to go and tackle sex trafficking, but what was the intent? What was the result? Now that we're looking at this three years later, we've seen that combating sex trafficking has become harder because they've moved their operations overseas, and that people that are engaged in legitimate, uh, you know, work in the sex worker industry are actually at more risk because they can't vet their their clients potentially through the internet forcing them to go out into the real world on the streets. And that's obviously a more dangerous environment for them, empowers the pimps and puts them in a bad spot. Um, so they they definitely suffered underneath that kind of a legislation. And it didn't even necessarily achieve its stated goal to this point. FOSTA-SESTA, and in fact, over its three years since being enacted in 2018, has only been invoked once by federal authorities who have elected instead to prosecute platforms underneath existing federal law, because with 230, the one of the exemptions is that you have to go and deal with things that are federal crimes. Otherwise, uh, those those types of things are not covered underneath Section 230. Uh, so, again, when we're looking at the kinds of legislation, we have to think about whether or not this is actually going to get used. What are the impacts? Uh, you know, uh, hurt as a result of this. These are all very important questions to think through, and I think that that's why it's important to press pause and really take it slow. I, th- I think in the part of that problem is somebody will roll their eyes and go, oh, well, it's sex workers, they're criminal. It, well, wait, a things like this, it's always, this is just in a technology sense, but the way laws kind of get to creeping in the first place and regulation gets to creeping is they'll take the most extreme example and then use that. And then the next thing you know, it's, you know, on your doorstep because now it's dealing with your social media account, then you're like, well, I'm not a sex worker. And it's like, well, yeah, but this is how they got their foot in the door trying to register, uh, legislate and regulate it. Isn't that kind of what history has taught us on some of these things? Yeah, absolutely. I think that regulation, while well-intentioned, uh, is one of those things that can very easily snowball. Um, and I think that that actually kind of got highlighted a little bit during COVID when we saw hundreds of regulations on the federal, state, and local level get waived in the name of fighting COVID-19. And the world did not you know, fall into chaos. The sky did not drop. People were not harmed as a result of waiving those regulations. Um, but they were there, right? So it, it begs the question of why. <laughs> Uh, and, and and then you realize it's because right. of these very particularized interests. And I think the same logic could very easily be applied to the Internet um, if we're looking at regulating it or particularly if we're starting to see people within industry ask for the regulations. It's fair to ask the question why. Uh, and, and the reason is, is that I think to a degree it's a lot easier to pawn it off onto the regulations than if something goes wrong. Be like, well, hey, we're not the ones who are responsible. It's the regulations that tell us we have to act this way. Uh, So that's one thing. And the other is about is that as regulations snowball around an industry, what that can do is that it it can improve the ability for incumbents in that space to retain their market power, which is ironically against the very thing that these politicians are complaining about, how these big tech uh, companies are often, uh, quote unquote, monopolies uh, of sorts. And I think that that's something that should give you pause when you're thinking about wanting to regulate this space. I think that there are valid concerns. I just do not entirely think that regulations may be the appropriate answer when we're looking at that question. And it's funny you talk about uh, accountability because there was another hearing uh, this week, uh, yesterday as we record this, there was a judiciary hearing where accountability of technology and where that meets government uh, really met. So in a way, it's almost like, what do you do when the government itself becomes the big tech company? Because this hearing was on uh, using facial recognition technology. And the story that came out of it was so awful that it actually made this one of the most bipartisan hearings I've ever seen, because it seemed like everybody on the dais was just kind of taken aback by this story. It's a gentleman named Robert Williams, but you can break it down for us a little bit. Tell us this man's story and why it it grabbed everybody's attention at this hearing about the flaws in technology when it comes to something like facial recognition technology, especially when it's empowered by the government in a law enforcement capacity. Yeah, I think think that this story broke my heart. I remember reading about it um, originally a few months back, and I ended up including his story in my law article. Um, that I wrote because I was so moved by it. Um, I thought that it was a great example of what happens when 
government can use technology unchecked. So to give the background of the story, basically there is a mall in Michigan that gets robbed. One of the stores, uh, they lose some watches. There was some video feed that was acquired. That video feed, uh, law enforcement was able to take a look at and grab a shot of, a, of the culprit. Uh, and they ran that photo of it, which was grainy, through facial recognition software and then relied upon that facial recognition software uh, to make the determination about who they needed to arrest. And it spat out a name of a man named Robert Williams who lived in Farmington. And law enforcement came, they arrested him in front of his wife and children. When the wife was just trying to figure out what was going on, they were extremely rude uh, towards her and told her to basically Google it. Uh, then they go and they bring him to their their precinct and they hold him in the area for 30 hours without bail. Uh, they insist that he's the culprit and they hold up a picture of the person who is uh, African-American. And uh, Robert Williams told them, I hope you don't think we all look the same. And their, their response was equally as snarky saying, well, I guess the computer must have got it wrong. And again, this guy was held in prison for 30 hours. He had nothing uh, that he was actually responsible for, but he got charged with first degree theft. And then ultimately, uh, when it got to the hands of a judge, it, they had to drop their charges because it did not line up. They didn't ask him any questions. They didn't even ask him for an alibi. They relied on the facial recognition technology so much so that it became a detriment. And and his was one story of many, um, an increasing number of them, because many law enforcement departments utilize facial recognition technology. And it, it really, I think, tugs at your heart because he, he was a minority. That was the only thing he was guilty of being, right? He was African-American and the cops relied on facial recognition, which is a great and a powerful technology, but it's also extremely flawed. So I think it, it really highlighted the problems when you have law enforcement with no rules, no guidance on how to use it, what could go wrong, and the cost of what happens when it goes wrong. It's a humiliating experience to get arrested in front of your, your wife and your children and get dragged away and held in jail, right? So I think that there's it, there was a lot of compelling emotion there to want to see change from both sides of the aisle because you don't want to see that happen. That undermines the institution. One of the things that came out of that hearing, look, folks may not be familiar with the facial recognition technology, what goes into that, but uh, part of the issues that came out was there's not a standard for what it even has to rise to. For example, if you get a speeding ticket, there's a industry-wide and a law enforcement standard that the speed gun has to be calibrated to a certain level to make it legally binding in court. There's things with this re facial rec There's bandwidths. There's pixelation. How grainy can the picture be? What software is it going to run through? Because there was multiple different companies doing the same thing, and each law enforcement agency might have a different company and a different software. There, there was so many flawed layers to this AI technology that when you're trying to talk about something like a legal standard, which should be very high because we have innocent until proven guilty— they don't even know that part of it yet, let alone how to integrate it into the court system, right? You're 100% right. The problem with facial recognition technology is it's extremely accurate when it's looking at someone like me, a white male. Uh, but it is notoriously falling off a cliff in its accuracy of identifying that it gets to a woman, a minority, um, any of those other kinds of classes. Facial recognition's ability to accurately estimate who that person is drops off a cliff, yet law enforcement doesn't have any kind of constraints as to when they can pursue uh, a person that's been identified through that feature particularly. And again, that's problematic, especially when we're talking about a minority community uh, and African Americans that have obviously had a fair share of stories in the news in the past year plus, um, and over the past several years, frankly, um, where they just feel like they are getting targeted by law enforcement, uh, and it's not even necessarily anything to do with them. And because there's no standard, uh, because law enforcement can be the early adopter of this technology, and nobody, frankly, really even knows that it's happening, uh, usually, right? And that's the other side of the problem. It just happens, and then you, and then something happens, and then we go and we do something reactive. So, from like a policy position, I think that you're absolutely right that we need to think through the question of how do we standardize. Um, you know, when it's appropriate for law enforcement to use that technology, at what level of confidence 
does that identification need to be in order for law enforcement to actually use it as a, a you know a prop for moving forward with their investigation to try somebody because we do have constitutional rights and the technology especially when it's getting relied upon in this fashion becomes more of a crutch and that means that law enforcement is actually not doing its job to protect and serve the public in the way that it wants to i wonder too if if we're going to talk about things that like police reform and criminal justice reform, probably the last thing in the world we need to be doing is using some area of society that is always already hotly contested and saying, oh, goody, let's sandbox this brand new technology on top of all that, where if you screw up, somebody goes to prison or worse. Yeah, I think I think the thing is, is that I, I, I can appreciate the technology for what it is, right? I know that facial recognition is extremely important. So there are some in Congress that would like to see an outright ban, which includes, uh, you know, halting any funding for R&D. Uh, and I think that that would not necessarily be appropriate because there are other technologies that are reliant on facial recognition. For example, uh, autonomous vehicles utilize computer vision, which integrates a form of facial recognition technology. Yep. And that development's kind of important when we're looking at trying to get autonomous vehicles on the road in the near future. Um, so I think that we need to be very practical about it. I think that we need to be uh, very cognizant about the privacy and civil liberty concerns when it comes to law enforcement use, especially. Um, and that, you know, again, going back to it, we need to have that standard. We need to have, we don't want to take away a tool from law enforcement because even in the limited context where it is used, it's still a powerful tool. It can be helpful. So I don't want to necessarily come down and seem like we're, we're poo-pooing on law enforcement. I think that they want to do a good job, um, but I think that this is something where it would actually serve to their benefit if we proactively had those guardrails in place. So that way, can it be used? Yes. In the context that it should be used, extremely limited uh, in order to warrant a justification to base your, your decision making off of the results of the technology, because we do have to acknowledge the flaws that are there. And this is going to feed into the already running arguments over technology and privacy because, and we heard it in this hearing, the proponents of facial recognition, one of the things they say is, yes, it's flawed, but what we need is a bigger database to make it work better, which, of course, then privacy concerns. People go, well, wait a minute. Why do you need a bigger database? That's just more data. It seems like this is going to just further exacerbate the already running arguments over existing technology and facial recognition is just going to be another front in the same old story that we've already been hashing out. Yeah, and I think that that's a valid concern. Uh, as a person who uh, who operates in a space where there's lots of photos of, of myself out there too, uh, when you see companies like Clearview AI and, and Palantir, which scrape social media websites against their terms of service, uh, and grab photos of you to expand their database, that's very problematic in my view, um, especially when the context of that is for the purpose of law enforcement. Uh, I think that that is very bad. Uh, even the uh, post office not that long ago, uh, it was discovered that they had a, a facial recognition that they were that they were using as a part of their, their program for trying to, you know, monitor who was stealing packages and stuff. And that involved contracting out with uh, Clearview AI and, and one of those companies. So, uh, you know, I think that it's very alarming. I think that we have to do a better job about setting some ground rules there because just because some people would argue that in the digital realm, as we've moved increasingly online, that our, our semblance of privacy somehow has been basically eroded. I would argue that it makes it that much more important that we try our best to, uh, you know, transmit our constitutional protections from one medium to another, especially since government uh, is using those technologies for their ends. Uh, on their side, right? So I think that that's what makes it that much more important. I'm not a lawyer, so we'll ask one of our lawyer things, but I'm really curious how it's going to get litigated out because we just saw the Supreme Court case uh, with college athletes and image and likeness, and I know that probably doesn't seem like a direct connection, but the thing about your face is not a privacy confirm. Your face is literally your identity in a lot of ways. So when you're talking about you know using somebody's face, uh, I think there's a lot of legal stuff that they haven't worked out yet, and the technology is just years and years and years ahead of the litigation of, you know, is your face your face? Because that's really what that comes down to, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's a very interesting legal question. Um, I know, like in Utah, uh, we we were able to go and fix this a little bit, but the uh, the department uh, over here was using facial scans multiple times a day. It was featured in a report a few years back. Um, but that also included scanning the faces of minors, right? So not only are we talking about just scanning full-fledged adults where 
you know, that's a different argument, I think, in and of itself. But now we're getting into the minor question, right? Uh, because minors can get, uh, you know, innocently captured in this process, too. And that raises a whole different set of questions as to where we are with thinking about those questions. So I, I do think that um, it will continue to get litigated. I think that there are some very interesting questions that have to be asked. Um, and I, I'm hopeful that rather than relying on litigation, I think the biggest problem with that is that you're relying on courts that can deliver inconsistent conclusions. Uh, and you're waiting, if you're waiting for the Supreme Court to make something and assuming that it rules in your favor uh, in a way that we think is pro-privacy and pro-civil liberty, we could be having this conversation 10 years from now and nothing would have changed because it's been making its way through the courts. Whereas I think Justice Samuel Alito kind of put it best where he says, you know what? Uh, the Supreme Court, while we can handle this, it's actually in the best interest of state legislators that are better equipped to deal with these things because the courts are not meant to uh, really handle this, so to say. Like they're meant to go and administer the law. Um, and that's why you can get that inconsistent conclusion sometimes. And states are best prepared and the federal government, I think, if we're going a little bit more broadly, are best prepared to try to craft legislation that can address these issues preemptively rather than having it go through the court process. And speaking of scanning the faces of minors, uh, I know you're a big gamer. You like to game. There's this story out there, and you were commenting on it on social media on Twitter, about Tencent Games kind of got admitted that they had been scanning faces f going back as far as 2018. Of course, this deals with China, so let's all be grown-ups that we know that the ruling regime in China uses facial recognition and a lot of other means for all kinds of nefarious things. But in this particular case, they were scanning games to uh, allegedly uh, enforce their video game bans for children, of all things. Now, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, so I remember, you know, how video games and MTV were going to ruin us all. But <laughs> now we've got this AI element on it where they're like, well, we're not really scanning kids. We're looking for adults. Well, you can't look for adults without scanning kids. So, you know, let's be grownups here. But this is not going to be something that just gets confined to Tencent in China. This is something that's going to be we've we've already had the stories about how TikTok can be invasive. We have found out about the Zoom calls and that controversy back during the pandemic. Everybody started doing Zoom calls and some of that may not be secure. Th this AI stuff is getting to be in a lot of areas where folks don't think about it, like their social media posts, like their gaming. Do you see the gaming side of it being a part of, well, this is something we're just going to have to live with? Or is that somewhere where folks start going, OK, this is a little too far. We should probably push back. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think that I think that people are wisening up to China, uh, especially over the past you know year and change with the pandemic. Uh, and realizing just how authoritarian that regime is. I think we could be better about identifying that, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm sure that as China's influence continues to grow, that it wouldn't be surprising to see some of their uh, sociocultural elements get into other countries too. Uh, video games for many years have been the target of politicians, even here in the United States, uh, you know, being accused of either causing violence and mass shootings or uh, being charged with being an addictive substance uh, for children and corrupting them. So there, it's not like video games have exactly had an easy ride since they've come out in the 70s, uh, riding through to today, especially as they've become more integrated and more popular. Um, the mobile gaming industry, which in particular Tencent is um, using this facial recognition technology with, I think it was uh, applied to over 60 mobile games. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing industries, right? So millions of children are are playing games that could be owned by Tencent that could, you know, theoretically maybe scan their faces. And China, they have this video game curfew. They, they don't let kids play more than an hour on the weekdays. They outright ban it in certain times. Uh, and, and in China, at least, again, because of the cultural aspects, uh, when they were asking parents about it, they're like, well, yeah, because we think video games are bad. We don't care. But I do care. Number one, I, I care because I think that it's extremely alarming that the Chinese government has that level of uh, penetration in terms of like control in their society where they can do that on one end. And on the other, I think it's just extraordinarily uh, bad faith, uh, you know, arguments and 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 truly just a bad way of looking at it from the Chinese Communist Party, because video games, like I said, they've been accused of everything, uh, you know, from from addiction to causing mass violence and, and, and anger management problems and all kinds of things. Uh, and the problem is, is that 
early studies were done to look at that and say something to that effect, but they were also very poorly done studies. And the most recent one, that was a six year long study of video games, uh, proved that, you know, 90 plus percent of the gamers, they don't develop addictive behavior. Uh, it's like only 10%, which now in a, a country like China, that is a lot of people um, that could theoretically do that. But I think what the lesson is that they're trying to draw out there is that the addiction is kind of tied to uh, more of the mindset of the person in terms of their personality, their makeup. If they have an addictive personality, they might be more prone to that. But if everything's done in moderation, then you don't have to worry about those kinds of concerns. And it bothers me to think that there might be other countries that look at that and be like, yeah, we should do that. I hope to... I hope to God that nobody, uh, especially the United States, where we even saw legislation last year looking at this, uh, trying to go and ban video games for uh, for having violent you know, ties or something like that. I don't want to see that happen. Uh, I think that that would be very bad for the video game industry and for gamers at large and uh, for children, too. I, I think that games are, are actually a great way for kids to connect with one another and actually form new kinds of friendships. You know what I got a kick out of this story was – that uh, the reason that the Chinese government was giving for doing the scans is they thought the kids were using their grandparents' accounts to get on and get extra gaming time. And I was like, man, how far have we come down the road in the last 20, 30 years where your grandparents have gaming accounts by default and it's not considered something very <laughs> strange, right? Because that, yeah. you know, that's not where this thing started. And now we've gone that far down the road with it. It shows how far into culture or in society, even in China, where it's much more restrictive than in the United States. Uh, th something like gaming has. It's not really a subculture anymore. It's just the culture. Yeah, I think that's one of the most exciting things about it for me, at least as a gamer. I, like I said, I've been gaming for well over 15 years and, and I just, I love it. Uh, you know, I, I think for me, uh, I, I used to love video games because I loved, uh, you know, in the early days when it was about uh, a, a, an immersive story and a good campaign uh, I think I really appreciate that about a lot of the early games I was playing. But now, even in the past, uh, when it starts shifting more to multiplayer with the in integration of the Internet to PlayStation 2 and 3 and beyond um, and these other consoles, I think the thing that's made me uh, more excited about it is being able to sit there and know that I can connect with somebody from Australia, South Africa, Europe, Germany, um, you know, all over the world. And, and make friends. And it was because of that uh, with my PC gaming stuff that I was able to actually meet up with a bunch of random people that I knew through the video game. And that was my only relation to them at a conference. And to me, I think that's awesome to address your point about like the kids real fast. I just think that that's more of like an understanding of actually where kids are at today, where uh, you could try to regulate how the video game industry operates, but kids are going to be kids one of the best things that kids are good at is circumventing the rules uh, and figuring out how to get there, right? So, I mean, I remember always sitting there and having the constant struggle with my mom about figuring out the password to the computer so I could go play games on the computer, right? And, and that's more or less what China is dealing with, but on a bigger scale today. Uh, so I think that it's funny that some of these old problems still persist even to this day. And I think that it shows, you know, some of the limitations of even the power of the Chinese Communist Party to stop kids from doing what they want to do, if that's, you know, what what's happening over there. Yeah, human nature's undefeated. You know what I found funny about it too, James? Uh, we we talk about video gaming. You know, like we're doing this right now. You're sitting in Tampa. I'm in my home in North Carolina right now. I'm actually in my closet. But I've done podcasts with people all over the world. I did one this morning with a friend in Austria. I've done people in Israel. Uh, the technology of this, and then I saw it in my own kids. My my two youngest kids are both high school age. During this pandemic, I was really worried about them socially, but it really became readily apparent. Like, well, wait a minute, they're so heavily online. They talked all day, every day, almost without break, and they still needed the physical interaction. I didn't like that part of it, but they're they're so integrated online with their social group. It, it was like a conference call. I know that dates me saying it that way, but the apps and the things they use, they were always. I could hear my daughter's friends voices all through my house because it's always on some device where they're always talking to each other. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think the thing is, is that, um, especially when you're looking at like the pandemic and, and all that, I think you really got exposed to just how integrated technology is into our daily lives, whether you were doing it for work or you were doing it for school or you were doing it just to connect with family for me, um, as you noted, I live out in Utah, but I'm originally from New York and all my family's back in New York, New Jersey, um, that area. And I think that I don't know how we would have been able to fare through this pandemic even 20 years ago 
if not for the strength of our of our uh, network and infrastructure for the internet to support all these devices even at our home. Um, so I think that that's something that's really impressive. But you're absolutely right. Like I said, for me, it's the best part about what I get to do as a gamer, what I get to do as a policy person. I get to sit there for a living and talk about technology policy. And I can do that with anybody anywhere in the world. And I've gotten to meet so many great people as a result of that. And I think that that is so fascinating because it would have been significantly harder. Again, like I said, go back 20, 30 years ago, right, to, in order to do this kind of a thing because of the fact that uh, the Internet wasn't where it was. The way that we've been able to leverage it to do these kinds of communications wasn't quite there. Right. So I think that it's done a great job in helping empower you to get your your show out there and talk to your people that want to hear what you have to say and to expose them to people like me that are working on these cool little things, right? Like that's what the internet does to me. That's the best part about it, honestly. Yeah. And to round us back to where we started, this is why I'm so adamant about the internet and protecting it because I've, I've been around the world a few times now. I've been to places of the world. I, I wish I hadn't seen quite frankly, in some cases there, the idea is that we, we sit around and we spout out buzzwords like freedom and liberty. When you see places in the world that don't have access to information and the fact that most Americans in the palm of their hand in the form of a smartphone have access to the entirety of human history and knowledge, I, I don't think we appreciate what a gift we have in this technology. And I know there's nefarious people that are using it for bad reasons, but I'm not willing to sacrifice that gift of freedom for anybody uh, regardless of what their cause is, because the, I think this is really one of the great things. And how blessed are we that, you know, I mean, we get to basically talk and commentate for a living and do this sort of thing, but what a, what a gift and what a time to be alive. And, and that's why I think it's important to talk about these issues with people like you, is because we need, we need to have a good understanding, not just of how to regulate some, but what is it? This is a great tool for freedom if we use it in the right way and a good tool to raise people up and bring people together and actually solve some problems instead of just complaining about things all the time without actually doing anything about it. No, again, you are 100 percent right. I, 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 I would go as far as to say I think Americans are a little spoiled when it comes to how they experience the Internet. Um, and, and I love this country. I love the people in it. But whenever I see somebody complain about censorship online, I'm like – you do realize that in Hong Kong, they just lost their last you know, newspaper that was pro Hong Kong, pro democracy, right? The Chinese government is exerting its influence there and arresting people on the daily. In Australia, during the pandemic, a woman got arrested for simply having a Facebook post looking to organize a protest over the lockdowns. That is censorship. That is something that you can't have happen in the United States. You can scream to high hell and back about how much you hate Facebook on Facebook and nothing's going to happen to you for that. You can go and scream about the government as much as you want on Facebook. And for the most part, nothing's going to happen to you. I think that, um, you know, it's something that we, we don't appreciate enough and that if we're not careful because we're so blinded by our hatred for the actions of these companies, which I think it's OK to call them out when they make bad choices like the Hunter Biden story and how Twitter handled that was bad. But at this, I'm sure if the New York Post looks at the clicks, they probably ended up doing all right in spite of all that. It doesn't mean that the decision was right. And I think that we can do, uh, we can have two statements be true where we think that they have the right to do what they want to do when it comes to making these decisions and that those decisions can sometimes be wrong. Um, so I think that, again, it's, it's more important about thinking about past that anger and thinking about, well, if I wanna have a good ecosystem on the internet moving forward, what does that look like? Is it really appropriate for the government to do this? And is it even constitutional? Um, a lot of these bills that we've seen come out, uh, especially like the Florida one most recently that got passed and signed by Governor DeSantis, it got sued and there's an injunction on it, in part because it's pretty clear how it's violating the First Amendment. Um, so I don't think that there's a lot of careful consideration there. And I think that everyone would benefit from just taking a deep breath and, and relaxing. The internet is great. And I think that we, we have to keep saying that, and I will take that to my grave. I will always say that the internet is great, and I like it how it is. Yeah, and you're talking to us from the Tampa area. Part of my family that lives in the Tampa Clearwater area is we have a whole branch that married in from Hong Kong. They were Hong Kong, and they married into our family and have done very well here. 
and talking to them last time I saw them when I was down there. And they're like, you know, they used to alternate every other year going home and they haven't been home in three years now and they don't know when they'll ever get to go back, if at all. So th- this stuff gets really real in other parts of the world and we better guard our freedoms or it's going to get real here. Uh, James Chernowski, it's been a great chat. We're going to do this again, but tell people where they can find your work. You got a lot of stuff going on. You're at the Li- Libertas Institute out in Utah. You're writing everywhere. You're doing media appearance. Tell people where they can find you and your stuff. Yeah, I think the best way to go and find me and follow what I'm doing is to follow my Twitter at JamesCZ19. Uh, I'll always post my latest articles and my and my media engagements over there. But I also have a personal website at JamesTranowski.com that people can see too. Um, so follow me on Twitter and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you moving forward. Yeah, we'll definitely have you on again in the future. You've been great. Um, He has a piece up right now that you can read. Throwing more regulations at the Internet isn't going to make it safer. That is a play on words. It's up at realclearpolicy.com right now. James, this was great, and we'll definitely do it again, my friend. Thank you so much for taking the time for us. Thanks for having me, Andrew. No problem, sir. It's no accident that, take any example you want around the world lately or in history, that when a tyrannical government wants to do something it shouldn't be doing, the first thing it does is clamp down on communication. In the old days, it'd be phone lines and newspapers and books. In the modern day, it's trying to turn off the Internet. We saw it in Cuba during the recent protests. In Hong Kong, as James mentioned, they just lost their last independent newspaper. When the governments want to do bad things and tyrannical regimes need to do untoward things towards their people, the first thing they want to do is kill the ability of people to communicate and spread information. That's why we need to be so careful about regulation of the Internet in a place like America where we're very, very spoiled rotten in how much freedom and information we have and in our technological ability. These things matter. And as we go forward and as Congress and us as a people try to figure out how we're going to deal with technology that has evolved very, very rapidly, we need to keep in mind that this isn't just for us. Internet was a a once-in-a-millennium leap in technology. It was a a once-in-a-lifetime thing for most of us in how our lives will change. And we want to make sure that future generations, whatever the next big leap is going to be, happens in an environment of freedom and liberty, not in oppression. Because those tools of freedom can also be turned against us. When it comes to the internet and freedom of speech and freedom of information, we need to understand that while regulation may be the buzzword of the day, prevention is going to be the best medicine. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Herd Tell. Please continue to like and subscribe and leave comments and ratings wherever you're listening to this podcast, whether it's iTunes, Spotify, Google, on YouTube, wherever it is. It's very important for us because it lets folks know that our little program is worth checking out. And on that front, we have a bit of an announcement. James was from a group called Young Voices. If you're not familiar, it's an organization that connects independently minded young journalists and advocates and subject matter experts to media outlets worldwide. It's kind of where you find, you can't even say the story of tomorrow in commentary and opinion because they're already doing it today. Well, we're very excited to announce that Herd Tell is going to be working with Young Voices over the next six months in their accelerator program, working on making this podcast and the video stuff we're looking to do a little bit better. I've crossed paths with these folks many times over the last few years doing writing and radio and other media. They're quality people, and I'm very excited to get to work with them. And we're going to have quite a few of them on this program talking to you as well. So be looking forward to that. That's all possible because you've been listening and supporting us, and we thank you very much. Please continue to do so. We'll do this as long as you keep listening. So wherever you are across the street and around the world, really hoping you and yours are well. Y'all take care. All the music on Hertel is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com. Somos la magia.